Why do Christians make such a big deal out of the name of Jesus? It's just a name like any other name, isn't it? Whatever you ask in my name, I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Okay, so there's that. But why can't we say whatever we ask in the name of Buddha, he'll do it? Or in the name of Mohammed, he'll do it? Why Jesus? We need to find out. What's in a name, anyway? I mean, are names actually that important? I think so. Take, for instance, Nike shoes. Everybody knows that name. The name is crisp and clear and energizing. But do you think people would want to wear them if they were named Nookies? I don't think so. What about the movie Shrek? Who in the world would ever name their kid Shrek? Who came up with that? It's a crazy name, right? But there's something about it that makes you curious and makes you want to see the movie. But would you feel the same way if the movie makers would have named him Arnold? No, no, no! Then there's the movie named Frozen. Just the name makes you curious. It makes you want to see it. But would you have felt the same way if they named the movie Chili? <laughs> Not so much. Names are important. So back to the name of Jesus. What does the name Jesus actually mean? The name of Jesus means Savior. So what's a Savior? A Savior is someone who saves or rescues someone from something bad, dangerous, or harmful. In the natural world, we might call a fireman a Savior when he rescues people from a burning building. We would call a lifeguard a savior when he saves someone from drowning. But when we talk about Jesus, we usually mean that he saves or rescues us from our sins and the consequences of our sins, and those consequences are spiritual death and hell. God is a holy God, and he's pure and he's righteous, and sin, big or small, is disobedience against God. It's evil, it's unholy, and it cannot exist in God's presence. That's why sinful people cannot go to heaven. We have to ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins and make us pure in his sight. If God did let sinful people into heaven, they would be completely destroyed in an instant because sin cannot remain in the presence of a holy God. His very holiness destroys sin. The person who sins has to be punished. The Bible says anyone who sins deserves death. It has to be destroyed in order for man to enter into God's presence. But God does not want to destroy people. He made them so he could be their heavenly father. He's done everything he can to get people to forsake their sins. He's trying to protect them from death and hell. That's why he sent Jesus to earth to be the sacrifice for us. But what happens if sin does come in contact with the holy God? Well, think of our God like this fighter. He didn't go chasing people around looking for reasons to destroy them. But if he did not protect them with the blood of Jesus dying on the cross and sinful man got too close to a holy God, they would self-destruct. That's why in the Old Testament, the Israelites always had to sacrifice animals on the altar. Someone or something had to die to pay for the sins of the people in order for them to enter into the presence of God. God didn't want people to die, so he accepted the death of animals in their place as their substitute. That was the protection that God offered to keep them from being destroyed in his presence. But today, Jesus is our sacrifice. That's the whole reason he came to earth as a baby. He knew from the beginning that his purpose for coming was to take our punishment and our sentence of death so we didn't have to. He did it so people could live exciting, wonderful, full lives here on earth and spend eternity with God. Just like the animals in the Old Testament took the punishment for the sins of those people, Jesus had to take the punishment for our sins so we could have a relationship with God the Father. We're the ones who deserve death, not Him. That's why the Bible said that when He became obedient to death, that is, dying on the cross for our sins, 
Then God exalted him and gave him a name that's above all names. So what do you think it actually means when it says Jesus' name is above every other name? I think it means that God's name is above all names because everyone will have to bow down to him. The doctors will bow, will bow down to him. Everyone you know will have to bow down to him. So that's why he's above every name. He's the king of kings. He's the um, king of people. He's the king of everything. And he's lifted up very, very high. That means that Jesus is the most powerful name and no one can get to the Father in heaven except through him. And that's important to us as Christians because Jesus is the one we worship and we know. He is the one true God. I think it's important that Christians know his name is above all names because he's the only one that can love. He's the only one that can help you. All the other ones, if you would ever pray to it, they would never be able to give you what God can do. He can give you the love you need if you were sad. And if you're angry, he can give you the peace that you need. It means that he is greater, and the reason why it's important is so that we know that no other thing, like no other God, no other video game or anything is greater than him. I think this part of the scripture, his name above every name, means that God gave Jesus a name that is apart and special from everybody else's and you can use his name to command the devil or Satan to not harm you or threaten you because God gave Jesus his name authority. There's no name, no, not stronger, not more powerful, and not more mighty. Jesus is the only name that is more mighty more powerful and more holy than any name. The reason why that the chapter says above every name because Jesus has healing in his name, power in his name, and salvation in his name. Hey friends, let's rock out with a super cool power verse. Today's verse is like a supercharged guitar riff, full of energy and power. It's from the Bible, the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 9. Here it goes. God lifted him up very, very high and gave him the name that is above every name. Now repeat it after me. Philippians 2.9 God lifted him up very, very high and gave him the name that is above every name. God lifted him up very, very high and gave him the name that is above every name. Philippians 2.9 God lifted him very, very high. He gave him the name above all other names. Philippians 2.9 God lifted him up very, very high and gave him the name above all names. Philippians 2.9 God lifted him up very, very high. He gave him the name above every name. Philippians 2.9 God lifted him up very, very high and gave him the name that is above every name. Philippians 2 and 9 God lifted him up very, very high and gave him the name above every name. Philippians 2.9 God lifted him up very, very high gave him the name that is above every name. God lifted him up very high and gave him the name that is above all names. Philippians 2, 9. Philippians 2, verse 9. God lifted him up very, very high and gave him the name that is above every name. Let's strum this verse and rock it out one more time. Repeat after me. Philippians 2, 9. God lifted him up very, very high and gave him the name that is above every name. God lifted it up very, very high and gave him the name which is above every name. Philippians 2 9. God lifted him up very, very high and gave him the name that is above every name. Philippians 2 verse 9. God lifted him up very, very high to give him the name of all names, Philippians 2.9. Today's power verse is Philippians 2 and 9. For God lifted him up very, very high and gave him a name that's above every name. The verse says, God lifted Jesus up super high, higher than anyone or anything else.
It's like Jesus leveled up to the ultimate boss, the most important person in the whole universe. He's not only powerful, but he also has authority. God gave him a name that's above every other name, a name that makes everything bow down. So next time you're playing your guitar or listening to your favorite praise or worship song, remember this verse. Jesus is the ultimate rock star, and his name is the most powerful name ever. Let's keep rocking out and spreading the awesome news about Jesus. Keep reciting your power verse, and remember, don't just be a listener of the word, do what it says. Christians pray in the name of Jesus. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Jesus told his disciples, These signs will follow them that believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. Praying in the name of Jesus has everything to do with Jesus dying on the cross and resurrecting from the dead. That's where his power comes from. And that's why God gave him a name that's above every other name. He now has the authority on earth to do anything. He even said so. 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So what's authority? Authority is when someone has the power or the right to make decisions, give orders, and enforce the rules. A policeman has authority too. It means they have special power and responsibility to keep people safe and make sure everyone follows the law. Imagine you're playing in a park and a policeman is there. They make sure everyone is behaving properly, not fighting, and following the park rules. And if someone does something dangerous or breaks the law, the policeman can tell them to stop and even arrest them if it's necessary. Now the wild thing is that Jesus has given you and me authority here on earth as his representatives to do all kinds of things we could never do without him. Jesus said, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy, and nothing will harm you. By snakes and scorpions, he was talking about demons and fallen angels, including Satan himself. Think of it this way, all sickness and disease and violence and crime and everything evil and bad basically comes from the devil and his buddies. <laughs> now they don't necessarily do this all by themselves. A lot of times they need people to carry out the dirty deeds for them. But most of the time, they're the ones behind the scenes where you can't see them, tempting people to do that bad stuff. Those people most of the time don't even know that's what's happening. So this means we can take authority over sickness and disease and the power of the enemy in the name of Jesus. But now don't get confused. We can't take authority over people. That would be a form of witchcraft and manipulation. God's given everybody a free will to do what they want. But we can take authority over the evil spirits who are trying to influence them in Jesus' name. We don't have any power as human beings. The power that we've been given is because of the name of Jesus. Jesus gave us, his disciples and followers, the power to heal the sick, pray, cast out demons, and perform miracles in his name. That's a lot of power. Now, this may come as a shock to you, but not everybody loves Jesus. From the very beginning, religious leaders and other people who didn't want to follow a God would get angry when the disciples or other followers would preach and teach in the name of Jesus. That's because even his enemies knew how powerful the name of Jesus is. There's something different about Jesus. This still happens in our world today. There's Christians all over the world who are being persecuted, beat up, sometimes put in prisons or even killed because they preach and teach in the name of Jesus. Why? because the devil knows how powerful his name is. His name is above every other name, and that's why he tries to stop him any way he can. This happened to Peter and John in the Bible. The apostles, who were Jesus' closest friends and followers, were doing amazing things among the people. They performed many miracles, like healing the sick in the mighty name of Jesus. All the believers would gather together in a special place called Solomon's Colonnade. Even though many people admired them, some were too scared to join them. But still, more and more men and women believed in Jesus and became part of their group. People were so hopeful that they even brought the sick into the streets, hoping that Peter's shadow might touch them as he walked by and heal them. Crowds came from all around, bringing sick people and those troubled by evil spirits, and every single one of them was healed by the power of the name of Jesus. However, the high priest and his friends, who were part of a group called the Sadducees, became very jealous. They arrested the apostles and put them in jail. But during the night, an angel from God came, opened the jail doors, and led them out. The angel told them, Go to the temple and tell the people all about this new life you have through Jesus. At dawn, the apostles went to the temple and began teaching the people again. When the high priest and his friends found out, they were surprised. They had the apostles brought to them and said, We told you not to teach in Jesus' name, but you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are trying to make us responsible for his death. Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than people. God raised Jesus from the dead, the one you killed by hanging him on a cross. God made him our leader and savior, 
so that Israel might turn back to God and be forgiven. We are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God gives to those who obey Him. When the high priest and his friends heard this, they were so angry they wanted to kill the apostles. But a wise teacher named Gamaliel stood up and said, Be careful what you do to these men. If their plans are just from humans, they will fail. But if their plans are from God, you won't be able to stop them and you might even be fighting against God. Gamaliel's advice convinced them. They had the apostles whipped, told them again not to speak in Jesus' name, and let them go. The apostles left, happy that they were considered worthy to suffer for Jesus. And every day, in the temple and in homes, they continued teaching in Jesus' name and sharing the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. As children, you're still living in a safe home where your parents protect you from most of the bad stuff that goes on in the world today. But as you get older and you get into middle school or high school, you'll start seeing how it's not very popular to believe in Jesus in the world today. Kids all over the world get made fun of or picked on because they believe in Jesus. Because of that, some Christian kids just keep their mouths shut and don't say anything about him. You're going to have to decide if you're going to be one of them or if you're going to be someone who's not ashamed to speak about the name of Jesus, no matter what people might say or do to you. As you get older, you're going to find out that the world believes that all religions are equal, that they all lead to heaven no matter what they believe. They'll tell you all gods are equal to Jesus, but it's not true. There are literally millions of gods out there, and they really believe some crazy stuff that has nothing to do with the gospel. Only those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ can be saved, and we're told to forsake any other god. The Bible is very clear. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by which we must be saved. No other name than the mighty name of Jesus. Buddha can't save you. Mohammed can't save you. The Hindu gods can't save you. Only those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. But saying that to people can get you in a lot of trouble. But don't back down. Be loving to them. Be kind, but never give in. Jesus is the only way to heaven and eternal life. The Bible is our only trustworthy guide to eternal life. Our friends and relatives need to know this so that we can rescue them from eternal damnation. We have to be strong and say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Boys and girls, there's something you need to know. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. That's what the Bible says. Satan and his demons know who Jesus is. They know what Jesus accomplished when he died on the cross and rose again. And they know that they have been defeated. And that in the end, they're going to end up in the lake of fire for all of eternity. Now Jesus is coming back to earth. He promised. He's coming again as a victorious conquering king. And when that day comes, the Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Kids, we need to give him honor and glory right now. He's our king. He's our savior. Jesus is Lord of all, and we must thank God for the mighty name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Close your eyes right now and just lift your hands towards heaven. Just whisper his name, Jesus. When you're sad or when you're lonely, just call upon the name of Jesus. When you're scared or in danger, just whisper the name of Jesus. When you don't know who to turn to, when you're lost and feel alone, just whisper the name of Jesus. Jesus. We glorify your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the mighty name of Jesus. 
I give my heart in devotion 